So I think we'll get started, and I want to uh, extend a welcome to all of you on behalf of AAAS and the Dana Foundation. Uh, it's the support of the Dana Foundation that makes these events possible, and we're delighted to have that partnership with them. Uh, my name is Mark Frankel, and my day job is to direct a program at AAAS called Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights, and Law. And it is this program which sort of has uh, responsibility for uh, organizing these, uh, uh, the series, if you will. And we're now, um, I think this is the end of, we're at, approaching the end of our third year. I want to acknowledge the presence tonight of uh, both the president and chairman of the board of the Dana Foundation, Ed Rover, who was with us, as well as uh, Barbara Gill, a vice president uh, at the foundation. Tonight's program, as uh, I indicated, is part of a larger series on neuroscience and society, and we're glad to see people returning, uh, uh, as well as a number of new faces here tonight. Uh, <clears throat> and we're going to take on the topic of stress, but before we do that, I want to tell you something about our last event for 2014. And that's going to be on October 28th here, starting at 530. It's just a few days short of Halloween. You might recognize that date, October 28th. And the topic is going to be illusion and the brain. And we've recruited a very well-known professional illusionist. His name is Elaine New, uh, who I'm told has dazzled audiences from Las Vegas to Washington, D.C., overseas as well. So you're not going to want to miss that one. I do want to encourage you to please arrive on time because his first act after my welcoming comments will be to make me disappear. <laughs> a feat that for whatever reason my staff seems to be very excited about. <laughs> In any event, um, we're also going to have two scientists who are going to help, help us understand or try to understand what's going on in the brain as it tries to distinguish between reality and illusion. So back to tonight's uh, event, I want to let you know that it is being videoed. Uh, the video, the official video, will be posted on the Data Foundation website, uh, and we will have a link to it, so you can come back to our website uh, and find that link. Um, and the first thing that I want to do, and I'm going to do this by acclamation, uh, based on all of the power that is vested in me by the AAAS, which is all of you probably know is the world's largest multidisciplinary science membership society in the world, that tonight, this floor, at AAAS is designated as a stress-free zone. There it is. So chill out, put all of your worries aside, not to worry for the next two hours, there will be no stress. We'll be talking a lot about stress, but there will be no stress. Uh, it's interesting, and as I was preparing for uh, uh, tonight's uh, program, I came across a number of suggestions for how one might deal with stress. Um, some un undoubtedly, as you will see, more science-based than others, and we'll hear of a number of those, I'm sure, from our speakers tonight, but I wanted to share with you just a few examples. This one may be the most well-known, uh, laughter as an antidote to stress. It also uh, has a considerable amount of science uh, behind it. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case with the next one, but it just sounds intuitively correct for fast, so just try slowing down a little bit. And, and who was going to argue with the source of that particular suggestion? Um, this next week, this next one I put in because it just sounds so idyllic to me, if, if we're only uh, that true. Doesn't that sound nice if we just had a way of, of doing that? Now, this next one, as far as I know, has never been endorsed by any scientist. But intuitively, it does sound like it might have a, an effect. <laughs> just, just pick the right throat to shove it down, please. Uh, uh, this, this next one also, as far as I know, doesn't have any uh, scientific endorsement. But again, intuitively, it just sounds like it might be the, just the thing. This next one, however, has a number of different components to it, and I would think, though I do not know, I would think that there is some scientific evidence, but maybe we'll find out during the course of uh, the night. <laughs> but this final one is the one that, is, uh, that I find most endearing, um, and those who know me will understand why, and if it doesn't have any science behind it, it should. 
All you need is love, but a little chocolate now and then doesn't hurt, Charles Schultz. So that, uh, that, that reference to chocolate uh, is a nice segue into my final slide, which I think is filled with hope for the, uh, the event uh, tonight and, and getting through all of this stress. And uh, after, our, after our presentations tonight, we will uh, we'll have a reception around 7 o'clock in which we will have food and beverage, including uh, some desserts. So let me, uh, on a more serious note, let me tell you how we're going to proceed. And then I'll be in a uh, position to introduce our first speaker. So after introducing our first speaker, and uh, she will give sort of an overview of, of stress, what's going on in the brain when we feel stress and we try to cope with stress. Um, we'll take a couple of questions after her formal remarks, and there are m standing microphones on both aisles in the auditorium, and we ask you to go to those because we are recording and we want to make sure to pick up the sound. Uh, as I said, one or two questions, and then I think uh, we'll go on. But uh, when you ask your question, if you would also identify yourself and your affiliation, I think the speakers would appreciate that, and perhaps all of us uh, would as, as well. After that, I'll introduce the second speaker, and we'll take uh, a couple of questions after his remarks. Uh, among other things, he's going to talk about some of the strategies and mechanisms that have been purported as stress relievers uh, for helping deal with stress. And, uh, talk to us a little bit about what's the science or the lack of science behind some of those. And then I'm going to ask both speakers to join me on stage right here, and we'll have a little conversation for about 10 or 15 minutes uh, where I will do some, uh, ask some questions and try to get them to talk uh, to each other uh, about uh, specific topics that may or may not have been brought up during the evening, but we'll see. And then we'll turn it over to the rest of you, and we'll open it up for conversation, again, using those microphones uh, before we break uh, for the uh, reception, which will be right outside the auditorium, uh, and we expect to end our evening around 7.45 p.m. So, I'm delighted to have all of you here, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the evening, and she is Janice Kegel Glazer who is director of the Ohio State Institute for Behavioral Medicine Research and a distinguished university professor in the Ohio State College of Medicine. Her research has focused on and demonstrated important health consequences of stress, including slower wound healing and impaired vaccine responses. And let me add, the program you have has these bios, more extensive bios, so I'm not going to go through all of their credentials, but just highlight a few things in both cases. She's a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and is a fellow of both the American Psychological Association and I'm happy to say AAAS as well. So please join me uh, in welcoming Dr. Kiko Glaser. I'm going to ask you to think about what happened to you in the last year. What are the major events when you think about your last year that were a big deal for you? What changes in your life? Stressful events are not the same for everyone. For some people, they're very different than another person. For example, a woman who's 35 who's been trying really hard to get pregnant uh, for two years and suddenly discovers she's pregnant has a very different response than a 14-year-old whose parents, who are quite religious and conservative, and don't know she's sexually active. It's the same life event for both, but the response is really different. So life events really do matter, and what makes them different in part are some of the things you see here. Controllability and predictability are some of what we know from animal studies. Uncontrollable, unpredictable shock is perhaps the worst, but un unpredictable and uncontrollable stressors are very difficult. Undesirability, do you want this thing to happen or not in terms of a life change? Losses are a really big deal. Did you lose someone important to you? And is it chronic or long-term, or is it time-limited? Is, is there a way out you see quickly, or is this going to go on and on? So that was the big events in your last year I want you to think about. And the next thing will be short-term events. In the last 24 hours, think about what happened to you. Did you have an argument or disagreement with anyone? Did you suppress an argument or disagreement? Anything else happened that most people would consider stressful? Anything happened to a close friend or relative? That's a particularly big deal for women where stressors in the network tend to reverberate on them. 
and discrimination in a variety of sorts. So those kinds of stressors can also be really important. When you think about what happened to you, think about two other things. How close was the person you had the argument with? It may matter a great deal more if it's your uh, uh, close friend versus a taxi driver. And the second thing I'd ask you is, how much have you been thinking about it since it happened? Because if you haven't been thinking about it, it's not a big deal. If it keeps coming back up, it's a big deal. So another way we think about stress is your response to it. Is it overloading or out of control? When people talk about positive stress, I kind of say, nah, doesn't work for me. Because if you say, I'm really busy and I enjoy it, well, that's not stress. If you tell me you're overloaded, out of control, you don't feel you can cope, that's stress. So when you're thinking about the events in your life, think about it in the terms that you see on the slide in front of you. And then finally, distress is a reflection of stress. When we're stressed, we typically have mood changes. People are stressed, they don't describe themselves as happy and jolly. Depressed, anxiety, and hostile are some of the things you see. We know that major life events, the really big things, can actually trigger clinical depression. There's good evidence for that. But minor events clearly have an impact on your mood. And when you're thinking about the, the events I asked you about, think about your mood today related to those events. OK, let's talk about why it matters and some of the pathways. I'm really going to be talking a lot about the immune system tonight because that's my big thing. And of course, I believe it's at the center of the universe, but that's another issue. Uh, my close collaborator on this work is uh, Ronald Glaser, with whom I share a close working relationship. <laughs> um, and we've, we've worked for many years on this topic. So you perceive a stressor, and you have a emotional response to it. If you're happy and busy, no, I'm not going to call it a stressor. But you perceive a stressor as being something overloaded or out of control or difficult in a variety of ways. Stress hormones can get triggered. We know the best, the best ones popularly known are cortisol and the catecholamines, adrenaline or noradrenaline, also known as epinephrine or norepinephrine. But there are a whole variety of endocrine changes that take place following perceptions of stress. And then we have white blood cells, lymphocytes, that have receptors like a lock and key so that when the hormones are triggered, you can have them, they, they respond, the lymphocytes, the white blood cells respond. And, they, they're, and they're, they respond in a variety of ways. So they're activating or deactivating or in a, in a variety of ways, altering your immune response. And then unfortunately, there's a really nasty feedback loop we'll talk about. It's that when you're really stressed and you have a variety of immune changes, you can actually go back to the brain and trigger more depression and stress. Fun things, right. What are the critical periods for stress? Well, when people are young, young, infants and young children, it's a bad time to be stressed. Child abuse, child adversity, we know clearly are effect, associated with a variety of endocrine and immune alterations. And it's really bad stuff. Um, but when older adults are also a critical period, we think about immune changes that are accumulating over time. Your happy thought for the day, is after puberty, it's all downhill. <laughs> but we really think about um, more serious changes that are health relevant around the ages of 60 to 75. And in that period, it becomes much more important. If at that point we're thinking of the glass as a glass of water is, let's say, half full, you don't want to spill any more out of it. You don't want stress or depression to take more away. And it becomes really important. And the more you take out of it, the greater the risk. So for many years, we've been studying dementia caregiving as an important and difficult stressor. Everything I talked about before in terms of major life events and minor life events is encapsulated in this kind of event. It's unpredictable. It's uncontrollable. It's a loss, an important interpersonal loss. Um, it's chronic. Um, and it really is solely very undesirable. And it has so many different spin-offs, including many daily stressors that are so difficult. And the anecdote you see here is a fairly typical one for a, a caregiver in the middle, caregiving for someone in the middle stages of dementia. The 88-year-old former airline pilot is a well-functioning man, obviously, previously. But for the past five years, he's been going downhill. And his wife of 40 years is really, really struggling. Um, 
He ha he can, at times, he doesn't even recognize her and, and calls her a stranger. Really labile moods, urinary incontinence, pacing at night, becoming at lost. Um, his wife of 40 years devotes her time to looking after him, and it really has now become the center of her life, and she has very little else in her life. It's a very distressing event. What happens under those circumstances to the immune response? Well, one of the things that Ron, my husband, has suggested was we should really look at immune responses to vaccines. For many years before this, we'd been showing a whole variety of immune changes associated with stress. But part of the issue is that you don't know what those immune changes mean. We wanted to give people a health-relevant challenge and see how they could respond to it. So what you see here are data from caregivers in red and very well-matched controls in blue, and their ability to mount a fourfold response to the influenza vaccine, one of the clinical indicators in terms of uh, an adequate response. When people are 70 and older, 70 or younger, you can see that the caregivers are clearly doing more poorly. But when we have 71 and older, the caregivers are falling off the face of the earth. Age and stress are a really bad combination. Stress also, also alters uh, uh, vac vaccine responses to pneumococcal pneumonia. In this case, everybody's doing fine in terms of the initial response. But we have former caregivers who are, are no longer caregiving and controls who continue to do well, but our current caregivers cannot maintain a protective antibody response. Why do we care about that? Well, together, pneumonia and influenza are the fourth leading cause of death among people who are 75 years and older. People get influenza, they get pneumonia as a complication, and it's deadly. That's why flu shots are so important for older adults. And yet with stress, people are not able to have a good vaccine response or as, as lasting a vaccine response. Well, it's not just limited to older adults. Our first study was actually with medical students in hepatitis B vaccine at a time when the hepatitis B vaccine was new, and we could actually offer that to students as a benefit in terms of their research participation. And we could show that students who were more stressed and more anxious took longer to respond to that vaccine. But it's now been clear across a whole series of studies that if people are more stressed and anxious, they respond more poorly to vaccines. So when you're going to get your annual flu vaccine, which I encourage you to do, I want you to think about how stressed you are. But another part of that, it tells us something about susceptibility to infectious disease in general. It's not useful to, to ask people to get sick for a variety of reasons. One is simply exposure. Let's take a socially isolated older person who's quite depressed. But they're socially isolated. They don't meet pathogens. And then let's compare them to this young married couple. They can be as happy as the proverbial clams, but they have children in preschool. They have a typhoid Marion or Marty in their house. They bring home absolutely everything. They have exposure. They're going to get sick but because of exposure. But it's the older person who actually has a poor immune response. And that's why the vaccine studies tell us something important about responses to infectious disease. Well, we were also interested in other important responses to, to stress that might be clinically relevant. Phil Maruka in our group, who is a periodontist and immunologist, said, we should really look at wound healing. He's a neutrophil guy. So I spent a lot of time combing through online stuff to find out how we could have a good wound healing model. And I was really distressed to find that there are not good surgical models because surgeons have this really nasty habit of suturing wounds closed. <laughs> and I wanted to look at what was happening with wound closure. So we decided to go out and wound people. <laughs> uh, we're using a technique from the dermatological literature where we create a small punch biopsy wound about the size of a pencil eraser on the arm. I've been through it a couple of times myself. It is not a big deal. What we found was actually startling. The difference between stressed caregivers and well-matched controls was large, 24% longer in terms of healing a small punch biopsy. Then John Sheridan in our group made punch biopsies on, on restraint stress mice and found it took the restraint stress mice 27% longer. Well, let's take it back to younger people. I said uh, Phil Maruka was a, a dentist, was a periodontist and immunologist. He said, let's look at medical, at dental students. They're a good population. And we should do oral wounds because they heal so much more quickly and easily, and there's no scarring. So he recruited 11 dental students to place a, heart, a punch biopsy on the hard palate. Touch your tongue to the top of your mouth, to the sides above your molars in the back. That's your hard palate. 
We have a punch biopsy there, um, the same size as we are placing on the arm, one on each side, depending on the timing. Um, the, when, I, when I talk about this, I can watch people in the audience visibly wince. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pain and discomfort ratings, I'm telling you, were low. But then someone came up to me after I gave a talk recently, and they said, come on, get real. These are dental students. They're not going to tell you dental pain is a problem. <laughs> These are the, this is for e data for each of those 11 students. How long did it take each of them to heal exactly the same small standardized wound? What you see is that no student healed his or her own wound as rapidly following examinations as they did after summer vacation. Some poor souls actually took more than twice as long to heal exactly the same size wound. And this experimentally is a better study. It's a within subjects design where each person is serving as his or her own control. Stress has very large substantial effects on wound healing. Well, we thought we were real cool because we published the first well-controlled study of wound healing, which we did. But then George Croce showed me this uh, quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a physician in the American Civil War. And he's talking about an important clinical observation. The same wound received in battle will do well in the soldiers that have beaten. It would prove fatal in those that have just been defeated. It's a sobering remark. Well, infection and trauma trigger the immune response. If you're infected or you're wounded, you really want a good, robust immune response. That's really important, because you need to get rid of the infection. You need to heal the wound. So they're critical to resolving the infections and repairing tissue damage. They'll attract immune cells to the site and help to heal. I'm going to skip a little bit here. But it matters with age because, again, one of those happy thoughts. Here's what ha happens around andropause or menopause with a really important pro-inflammatory cytokine, IL-6. What you see here is it's starting to trend up as well when other hormones are trending down. And what you don't want is for that to go higher and higher. And the reason you don't want it to keep going up is because there are clearly age-related diseases that are associated with inflammation. Cardiovascular disease is one of the biggest ones that's really increasingly recognized as, an immunologic, as immunologically uh, important. But the whole list that you see there, even frailty and functional decline, high levels of IL-6 actually predict frailty and functional decline several years later. Inflammation is really important and important to control. Well, one of the things I've learned when I do public talks is it's really important for people to respect you as a speaker. And one of the ways you do that is you quote important people so they'll know that you really know literature. <laughs> I'm quoting a toothpaste ad. But it makes a really important point about small infections and why they're important. I was talking to a periodontist a few years ago, and I said, you know what, I don't understand this big buzz about periodontal disease and cardiovascular disease. Why do we keep hearing about all this connection? And she looked at me as if I were more than slightly dense. And she said, if you have periodontal disease, think of it as a fist-sized wound in your mouth that's not healing, a source of infection, a wound. Why do you think it's important? So when you go home tonight and you're thinking you're too tired to floss, I want you to remember the fist size wound. So we can go straight down this path, stress, depression, immune dysregulation, infection problems, wound healing, and increased pro-inflammatory cytokine production. Unfortunately, there's another path as well. Back in the, in the 1990s, Michael Mays showed that major depression was really important in terms of pro-inflammatory cytokine production. Depression is now, by the way, recognized as an inflammatory disease. And then we found that even minor depressive symptoms and mood could be associated with higher levels of inflammation. I'll talk about chronic stressors and acute stressors. So they all really matter. So you can go straight down the pathway, but you don't have to do that. You can just go directly there. And that's part of the problem with stress. In another study, we were looking at a laboratory stressor. And this is a, a stressor that it's called the Trier stress, Social Stress Test where I ask people to do a, a, a brief talk about a job they've never had uh, to a panel of white-coated people and then do mental arithmetic. It's a really uh, uh, good stressor. It lasts about 15 minutes, but it 
evokes a good IL-6 response. People do it all the time. Um, and what's interesting about it, this is only a 15-minute stressor. 45 minutes and two hours later, what we see is IL-6 still trending up. And like the rich get richer, the more depressed or the higher levels of depressive symptoms, and I'll tell you, oops, sorry, in this study, they were not that high, um, are still having a higher response. So that stress can actually help promote inflammatory responses um, to other stimuli. Well, what happens with chronic stress? Let's go back to the caregivers. We have 225 people that we've measured over a period of six years, thanks to an NIH merit award. What happened to them over time? This is modeling change in caregivers and controls as a function of their age. So you see age down here. Here's the trajectory for our caregivers and here for our controls. This average rate of increase in IL-6 is about four times as large in the caregivers compared to very similar controls. One of the reviewers asked an interesting question. They said, what might that mean clinically? Can you give me some kind of benchmark about what we could say about that? So I went in the literature, and I was looking at some of the epidemiological evidence, and they talked about the upper quartile as an area of risk. So I went back to our data, and I looked. So if we were talking about the upper quartile, our caregivers would cross that line around age 75 our controls would cross, cross that line around age 90. Stress has really important effects on inflammation, and a chronic stressor can have really important effects. Well, you might say, OK, caregivers have stress. Do they get sick? Yeah, they really do. A variety of studies, diabetes, coronary heart disease, metabolic syndrome, and they also die at higher rates and earlier than that you might expect. I'm going to skip that because I'm going to be a little short on time. Telomeres have been one of the big buzzes recently. Uh, telomeres are really important. Um, and one of the things that inflammation does is it shortens your telomeres uh, because it helps shells keep dividing when you don't want them to keep dividing. So the bits of DNA on the end of the chromosomes get shorter and shorter, and this is not a good thing because it's associated with age-related diseases and mortality. Well, are we surprised? Caregivers have shorter telomeres than very well-matched controls. That was first demonstrated in a really nice study by Apple and Blackburn. Blackburn got the Nobel Prize for her work on telomeres. Um, we have a replication in collaboration with uh, Wing in, in, at NIH in immunology and extension of the study. But there are a number of studies now. Stress shortens telomeres. Well, when you're stressed, what are you most likely to do? You don't sleep so well. You don't exercise. You may turn, like I do, to comfort food. If you smoke, you're more likely to smoke more. And while moderate alcohol use is good for your inflammatory response, alcohol abuse is really bad. Sleep. How many hours did you sleep last night? How many hours have you slept for the last week? This is a really interesting study because they're using very young and healthy people. They're between the ages of 19 and 34. And they're depriving them of only two hours of sleep each night. And when they do that, here's the curve for when they're depriving them of only two hours each night compared to when they let them sleep for eight hours. And these are young and healthy people. That's why sleep is such a big deal in terms of health, because among other things, it really uh, stimulates your inflammatory response. So more good news for you today. If you didn't sleep well last night, if you really had a rotten night, your IL-6 is higher today than it should be. I'm not going to talk about treatment. The next speaker will tell you all about the good things you could do, but I'm going to match that. So the one thing I will say is physical activity is perhaps one of the best things we know. People who are more physically fit, who are more active, have lower levels of inflammation. Many, many, many studies. It's one of the best documented effects. Well, here's one of the issues we always have, is stress and depression promote unhealthy diets. Most people, when they're stressed, don't reach for broccoli unless it's well covered with holiday sauce. <laughs> I'm not going to give you all the details on this study, because it's really elaborate and, of course, really well controlled. But it's a really cool study that we just published. Um, we gave people two high-fat meals. It's called a meal challenge study. So you're asking people how they're going to respond metabolically to the meals. 
the important, the, we had one meal was high saturated fat, one was high oleic sunflower oil, didn't matter. I can tell you all about it, but that, but that is not part of what I'm going to talk about. Both meals, importantly, were 930 calories and had 60 grams of fat or 60% of their calories from fat. Well, you're saying to yourself, I never eat meals like that, never, never, never. Well, have you ever had a Big Mac cheeseburger and a medium french fries? Or perhaps a Burger King double whopper with cheese? These are common fast food options. These are what we based our meals on. And our meal, by the way, up there is scrambled eggs, sausage gravy, and biscuits with a whole variety of ways to make it exactly what we wanted metabolically in terms of the ingredients. The quick version of, this, of the longer story on this, and there's some more interesting data that goes with it, is we were looking at what happened to energy expenditure when we kept people captive in the clinical research center, the research floor, after we gave them this high-fat meal. We're looking at energy expenditure using um, indirect calorimetry. And the cumulative difference between people who had one stress the day before, remember I asked you about having an argument with anyone, da 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 da, uh, and those who didn't, was 104 calories. That's not a big deal on any given day. If that happened every day for a year, and you had a high fat meal like that, it's 104 calories. We also found that people had higher insulin and lower fat oxidation when they were stressed. Why does that matter? You're not burning fat, you're storing it. So you get more of the belly fat, which is the metabolically bad fat. This may seem a little odd, but we actually have a, a conceptual replication as well. So I'm pretty confident about those data. Skip that one for a second. So back to inflammation. We care about weight, we care about fat a lot because fat cells, adipocytes, are little fat factories. They, they actually produce cytokines. So the heavier you are, and especially belly fat, the more you're producing cytokines, the more it matters. And that's why it's such a big deal. So last, in, last uh, data slide or last talk slide. You go down here, and what do you get? Increased pro-inflammatory cytokine production. But that's not the whole story. The things you see there are called sickness behaviors. Think about the last time you had the flu, or your spouse, or your son or daughter did. You feel really miserable, because you have a fever, and the fever is in part reflecting this flood of cytokines that's trying to take care of the flu. You get depressed, or you have, your, your mood is pretty poor. You're certainly very fatigued. You have a lot of joint pains, but we also know that inflammation actually enhances pain sensitivity no matter what. And you have cognitive problems. You don't think real clearly. So you go down there because you had that straight pathway. You have that pathway that helps feed it. And then the really nasty thing, when you have enhanced pro-inflammatory inflammatory cytokine production, you're going right back up to stress and depression. Because I mentioned that one of the things that we're learning more and more is depression is in part an inflammatory disease. And high levels of inflammation in cancer studies, when they actually give people cytokines as a treatment, produce clinical depression. So it really matters. So that's all my stuff. I'm not going to tell you how to treat any of it, but the next speaker will. But I want to give credence to my important funding sources, who have been really good, to my husband and dear collaborator who's responsible for the immunology, Ron Glaser, to Martha Baluri, my nutritional colleague, and Bill Malarkey, our endocrinology colleague. And if you're interested in any of, the, any of the papers from our lab, we have all of them on the website. Thank you. Uh, I think you are both an expert and an authority. Uh, <laughs> love that cartoon. So we'll, uh, if you have a question now and want to raise it, please go to the microphones, and we can take uh, one or two uh, quick questions before we move on. And please identify yourself and name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Julia Abrahams. I don't have an affiliation. <laughs> um, just out of general interest, um, one hears about all kinds of um, uh, pharmacological agents to interfere with uh, anxiety and depression. Do they also then break that cycle uh, for the immune response? It's a really good question. Um, there's indeed some good evidence that antidepressants uh, may in fact reduce inflammation. One of the interesting things that's appearing in the psychiatric literature is that treatment-resistant depression has a stronger anti-inflammatory component, actually, or inflammatory component. And there was actually a really nice study by Andy Miller and his group from Emory 
where they were looking at a TNF-alpha blocker, a blocker for major cytokine um, and treatment-resistant depression, and they found the group that was most responsive were people who had higher levels of inflammation to start with. But yes, um, treatment for anxiety or depression really does matter and, and can be really helpful. Hi, Heather Dean, the National Science Foundation. I'm curious, are there gender differences in some of these responses that you see to stress? Um, yeah, they are, and they get really complicated. One of, the, one of the things that my lab has done a lot of work on that I didn't reference tonight is we do a lot of work on marriage. So we bring married couples into the laboratory, we have a catheter in their arm, and we have them argue about a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> um, we even looked in one study at their wound healing. Um, and, and in those cases, clearly, women are much more sensitive to interpersonal stress than men. Um, women's responses are much more clearly related to the hostility or, or aggression in the interaction than men's are. Um, women are, the, the literature suggests, uh, much more affected by a bad marriage. So interpersonal stresses for women are indeed far more serious. Some of the literature suggests that um, for a man it matters if you're married, for a woman it matters about the quality of the relationship. <laughs> All right, one more question now, and then we'll move on. Yeah. This is just a, a quick one. Now, I'm Marie Burton. I'm a citizen. Uh, the, uh, with your, what you said, have said about, uh, much has been said about the inflammatory cascade and a lot of different aspects, and now in association with depression. Uh, it seems that the aspirin a day, baby aspirin a day, people sort of go, one, one moment it's hot, and the next moment it's not. And just, can you comment on that, how it would affect, say, a person with uh, chronic depression? or? how it might you know, enhance it, their medication. They are anti-inflammatory. I don't know if it's enough of a, a nip to actually make a change. Um, the quick version of what's actually made a change in our laboratory stuff I didn't talk about is we have a really nice yoga study showing that practicing yoga, it was a well-controlled, randomized controlled trial, can be anti-inflammatory. And we have a couple of trials with omega-3, one of which was funded by NCAM, that show that uh, Omega-3 can also be an anti-inflammatory. Um, those are the things I know about best, and I hesitate to speak out of my area of confidence otherwise. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. David Chertleff, who has spent uh, 19 years of his career at the National Institutes of Health. Um, he is currently with the, uh, he's a deputy director of the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, um, and will be telling us a bit about what they do uh, in terms of investigating the uh, scientific base of uh, bases for a number of these, um, um, what shall I call it, proposed or purported uh, ways of dealing with stress. Uh, so. Uh, uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about some of the techniques that are used and how well they stand up, if you will, to scientific scrutiny, as, as well as a number of other things about the work that his uh, agency uh, is uh, uh, sponsoring. So uh, with that in mind, please uh, joining me in welcoming Dr. Shirtleff to the podium. Well, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's really a topic that I've uh, only been an NCAM a short time, but it's a topic that I've really grown to love and really uh, understand more as I, as I become more in, in, engaged with the NCAM community. Um, so just to give you, for those of you who may not know, uh, NCAM is a part of the NIH. We're one of the 27 centers and institutes. We were established in 1998, so a fairly young institute. And unlike most institutes at the NIH, we really don't have a disease focus. Uh, so that makes our mission very challenging, but also very interesting. Of course, uh, we, we are part of the NIH, so our, our main mission is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of knowledge to enhance health, uh, length in life, and reduce illness and disability. And for the purposes of this talk, uh, we're really interested in symptom management, particularly stress and pain management. And I'll get into that in more detail later in my talk. So our mission is really quite simple. Uh, it's through rigorous scientific research. We want to determine the usefulness and safety of complementary interventions. Many of these are untested. And I think uh, we at the NIH pride ourselves on being uh, the, the organization that provides objective research-based uh, evidence 
for these interventions. And we want these interventions to be useful in use, so we're also interested in how they improve health and health care, uh, particularly within mainstream health care. Our strategic plan has six major initiatives to improve the capacity of the field, so we have a large training program. Many young scientists are interested in complementary approaches, and we have a, a large training program to get people proficient on how to do the research in these areas. We, about half our budget uh, is research on natural products, primarily on non-vitamin, non-mineral botanicals, and I'll share some of that data with you later. But uh, we're very much interested now in moving into the area of probiotics, and I'll get into that a little more as well. We're expanding our research on mind and body interventions, which I think is very important for this seminar. And uh, we're very much interested in non-pharmacological approaches to pain management and symptom management. We want to increase integration into health care. We want to make sure that the, the uh, interventions are effective and useful in, uh, in, in health care. And we want to get a better sense of how people are using these approaches. So we do surveys to understand how people are using these in real world settings, these complementary approaches and natural products. And because there's a controversy, there's a conflicting literature about complementary approaches, we have a very active website to disseminate evidence-based information. So I don't think either the believers in complementary approaches or the skeptics in are very happy with us. So I think we're doing the right thing. We're just where we need to be. But I, I encourage you to look at our website because we have a lot of good, objective, research-based information on our website. Much of it's supported by NCAM uh, dollars. So just to get back to identifying real-world patterns, uh, we've, uh, for the last several years, uh, collaborated with the CDC in conducting the National Health Interview Survey. This was conducted through the National Center for Health Statistics. And it, it touches on a wide range of topics, uh, including complementary health practices. It interviews approximately 35 to 40,000 households, 75 to 100,000 individuals. These data are published widely. Uh, NCAM has participated in 2002, 2007, and 2012. Unfortunately, the data is slow to come for the 2012 survey, so I'm going to, I've only been able to show you the data from 2002 and 2007, but I think that the patterns are pretty much stable, and, and I think you'll get a good sense of how people in the United States, at least, are thinking about and using complementary approaches. So just to give you a snapshot, this is 20, 2007 data, 40% of adults use some sort of complementary approach. It, it amounts to about $34 billion out-of-pocket expenses, which I, I think is quite large. 1% uh, of the total health care expenditures, about 10% of individuals' out-of-pocket costs. It cuts across all demographics. Women tend to use these approaches more than men, and they tend to be used more on the West Coast than in the southern part of the United States, and there's probably a lot of reasons for that, which I could go into if anybody's interested. And greater use uh, in people with higher education levels. So that just gives you a sort of a snapshot of who's using these approaches. When you look at the type of approaches people are using, meditation, massage, and yoga are the top three, and those didn't change too much from 2002 to 2007, although in 2007 more people were engaged in these practices. Early indications from the 2012 survey suggest that yoga now is probably the number one complementary approach used by uh, people in the United States, and I think that's true. I know in my neighborhood there's a yoga studio on every corner now, it seems, which is great, actually. I think it's wonderful. Um, in looking at natural products, uh, we look at the percent of adults using specific natural products. What's interesting here, getting back to the last talk, is if you look at omega-3 fish oil, because I think, think of some of the research we have supported, that's gone from a very low level of use to a very high level of use from 2002 to 2007, and I think those are trends are continuing. Interestingly, if you look at echinacea, ginkgo biloba, St. John's wort, those uh, trends of use have actually gone down from 2002 and 2007. We, we want to believe that some of that reason for the decrease in use of some of these natural products is due to the research NCAM supports in that we showed that echinacea is ineffective against the common cold. Uh, a large multi-site trial done over many years showed that ginkgo biloba does not, in fact, prevent dementia in older adults. And St. John's wort is ineffective in major depression, although there may be some evidence that it's useful for moderate depression. St. George's wort is interesting uh, in and of itself, too, when it's co-administered with other medications like protease inhibitors for HIV, oral contraceptives, or cyclosporin for, as an immunosuppression, St. John Wart's actually make these drugs less potent. So it's very important, I think, when you're using these um, supplements, it's important that you talk to your physician about them because there are these potentially adverse 
what we call herb drug interactions. And that's something your physician and you need to know if you're using some of these supplements, how they affect medications you're currently using. So I mentioned uh, the natural products and our interest in botanicals. An area that we're really moving into and we're very excited about is the role of probiotics in this, what we're calling the brain-gut axis. And NIH has launched a major initiative on the Human Microbiome Project. So we're really understanding the gut microbiome at a very detailed level, at a genetic level. And we have a very strong indication in preliminary research, at least in animal work, is showing that these probiotics acting through the gut microbiota are really affecting a variety of systems, not only just your GI function, but they're actually impacting your immune system and importantly for, the, for this, uh, this seminar, your brain. And we think that probiotics may be very beneficial for treating or at least uh, supplementing uh, traditional medications for pain, stress, anxiety, and depression. So this is an active area of research we hope to move into in the next few years. A lot of animal work, as I said, what's lacking is the human subject and uh, patient studies that would help confirm some of the animal work that's been ongoing. So that sort of gives you a, a, just a very brief snapshot of our natural products portfolio, where we've been, where we hope to go. I want to now move to our uh, mind-body portfolio, which is growing. It's about 50% of our research portfolio, but I think over the next few years, it could go to 60 or even 70%. We find this a very fascinating area of work. The public is fascinated. I don't know how many of you saw this Time Magazine article in February of uh, 2014 this year, looking at uh, talking about the mindful revolution and how people are, are seeking out mind-body approaches to, to handle the 24-7 stress that uh, Jan talked about in her talk, and uh, they're not, their wounds aren't healing, they're not getting enough rest, and so people are, are seeking these kinds of approaches. From our perspective, uh, when we think about mind-body practices, we uh, obviously think about mindfulness-based stress reduction as, as a major intervention, meditation, but we also think about other mind-body practices that you may not think of, acupuncture, spinal manipulation, massage, and hypnosis. And as I said, currently it's about a $43 million program 128 grants, and I think that will likely expand over the next few years. When we think about the types of research we're interested in at NCAM in this area, we're interested in supporting clinical evaluation on the efficacy of mind-body approaches. We want to be sure how they're used, they're useful and, and used. Uh, we want to develop and validate objective measures for assessing the mind-body intervention. How do we really know when this, what are the biomarkers that may be useful in us getting a handle on what's really changing when people do these, uh, the, take these practices? And we're going to develop precise criteria and standards for specific practice to ensure that it's reproducible and it has continued effectiveness uh, when, it's, when it's practiced in, in healthcare settings. And importantly, uh, this is really an initiative that we started uh, two years ago, and we continue to grow as our collaboration with the Department of Defense and uh, Veterans Affairs. And this really came out of the fact that uh, there's actually a Wall Street Journal article, uh, September 12th Wall Street Journal article, if you're interested, that's really talking about how the VA and the DOD are really moving quite strongly and quite rapidly into adopting and thinking about complementary health practices from mind-body approaches, acupuncture, and, and other complementary approaches, primarily for managing pain and PTSD. This is because of the onslaught of, of patients coming back from Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. Many of them are being given uh, primary care, and some of it's just not working. Uh, the system is overloaded, and the VA and DOD are, are thinking about other ways to manage these problems. And we've been fortunate enough to collaborate on, on a number of research projects that I think will continue and grow over the next several years so we can really get a, develop an evidence base about what kinds of uh, mind-body and other approaches really work uh, in this population and can be most beneficial to this group. And most interestingly to me as a behavioral neuroscientist, we're really moving into the area of identifying neurobiological mechanisms of, um, of, of these approaches. How do they change the brain? And one important area that's really been the study of neuroscience for many years now is the idea of neuroplasticity. That is really the capacity of the brain. It's a dynamic organ that can change uh, nerve cells, change connections, neuro, new ne neural networks can be laid down, and neuro new connections can be formed um, in response to new information, sensory stimuli during development. And the flip side of this as well is that psychiatric disorders uh, can impact neuroplasticity as well. When we think about P 
PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It really impacts uh, and changes the plastic nature of the brain in terms of changing the amygdala. The amygdala, as many of you may know, is the sort of emotional center of the brain. And this was touched on in the last talk. And then when you're under a lot of stress, of course, there are these changes in, the, in your immune system, as was described elo eloquently in the, last, in the first talk. But it's also changing a variety of brain mechanisms. And the, the amygdala gets activated when uh, emotional stimuli are presented. And, and it impacts the hypothalamus, which then release stress hormones that we heard about, increases blood pressure, and causes other physiological changes. It also activates the striatum, and, this, and we know the striatum is involved in habit formation. So instead of th thinking more uh, deliberately about something, you're more likely to just engage in natural habits. Go eat that McDonald's hamburger, for example, or do other things that may be more prepotent and more laid down than really thinking about um, what's going on and, and being more deliberate in your thinking. And that's the other thing the amygdala does. It actually turns off the prefrontal cortex of the brain. That is the area that's involved in executive function learning memory. And uh, Amy Arnstein, a well-known neuroscientist at Yale University, has really come up with thinking about this work, uh, thinking about this problem in her work, and has thought about really what stress does to, to working memory and how it, 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 it leaves people just doing these sort of habitual responses that may not be the healthiest. So when we think about mind-body approaches, what we're trying to really do here is think about how we can strengthen and lay down the circuits that are more prepotent from the prefrontal cortex to really think about top-down guidance of attention, inhi inhibiting inappropriate actions, and most importantly for a mind-body approach to regulate emotion. And that's really the basis of meditative practice. It's really taking advantage of this neuroplastic properties of the brain to really uh, train the brain and increase certain connections within the brain that will really allow for skill acquisition and take advantage, as I said, of this induced uh, plastic changes that we know can occur. And when you think about what meditative practice can do, it's really targeting very important uh, brain circuits, such as executive function, orienting, the default mode network, which we know is important for deliberative thinking and, and, and less stressful um, um, emotion and alerting. And this is really what the idea behind meditative practice is, mind-body stress reduction, is to strengthen these uh, important neural circuits that will reduce stress and, uh, uh, importantly, give people more opportunity to engage in thoughtful, reasoned thinking. And just to give you one example of how this is being done, work being supported at NCAM, this is the work of Hosel et al. being at the Mass General Hospital in Boston. And they were interested in, they really found high stress people in the Boston area. I don't think that's too hard giving, uh, that's where I grew up and I know how stressful it can be uh, in that area. Uh, a lot of high uh, charging over um, ambitious people. Um, but they, they recruited 27 participants uh, with very high perceived stress scale. They had them take uh, an eight-week uh, mind-body stress reduction program, and they, they scanned their brains before and after this eight-week course. And what they were really interested in is getting back to that emotional center of the brain, the amygdala, because in rodent studies, what happens when, when rodents, at least, are exposed to stress? I don't know what a stress for a rodent maybe is. A hungry cat would be one, I guess. Um, their, their amygdalas actually grow in connectivity and grow in volume. And of course, as it grows in volume, it's a more active part of the brain and taking over more control of behavior. So the, the, these investigators are very much interested in knowing would, of course, mind-body stress reduction reduce, per, reduce perceived stress, but would also affect the amygdala. And of course, this is preliminary data, but what they showed is that larger decreases in perceived stress over here were associated with larger decreases in the amygdala gray matter. So it's, a, it's sort of exactly what they, what they thought. Of course, that wasn't true for all individuals, so we really do need to learn more about what's happening on this side of the curve over here. But at least suggests that active relearning of the emotional response to stress can lead to beneficial changes in brain structure. And this is really important because these people weren't put on a desert island or went to the Bahamas. They were actually still living their daily lives in the Boston area doing what they do day to day, but through this training and through presumably these training and, and changes in, in the plastic changes that occur within the, the amygdala, 
many of them benefited from changes in their perceived stress and reduction in gray matter volume in that brain region. So very intriguing results, still a lot to be done here in terms of just not what it's the amyg how is the amygdala changing, but what other parts of the brain are, are being benefited by uh, mind-body stress reduction and other meditative practice. So very active area for NCAM and something that's very exciting to me as a behavioral neuroscientist. So moving on to another important area for us uh, in terms of symptom management is pain. And um, we're really interested in how mind-body approaches can be developed uh, to, to manage pain. Uh, and, and getting away from thinking about uh, pharmacological interventions. Right now, the, the primary uh, care uh, use or first-line care for chronic pain is opiate medications. And if you've been following the news, you probably know that opiate medications now account for more deaths than traffic uh, fatalities, uh, uh, car accidents in the United States. And overdoses from opiate medication now exceed those for heroin and cocaine combined. So extremely difficult, challenging problem when people are on medic, uh, opiate medications. Certainly they have benefits in reducing pain, but there are these many adverse effects of overdose that we need to pay attention to. And having a non-pharmacological intervention may be at least a complementary way of, of thinking about pain man management more ho holistically. So this has been a very active program for NCAM and the NIH in general is pain management. And for our perspective, we're really interested in exploring the neurobiological and behavioral mechanisms of pain, the emotional and cognitive control, contextual factors, and we're also interested in uh, the comorbid conditions that are associated with pain, substance abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, sleep that was alluded to before, anxiety, and stress. And when you think about why, you know, when you look back to the survey, the National Health Interview Survey, it's really the reason people seek out complementary health approaches is because they want pain relief. If you look at those uh, adults who use uh, complementary approaches, the, the, the three major reasons they seek them out is for back pain, neck pain, and joint pain. Arthritis as well is also can be a painful condition. So the public is interested in thinking about using these approaches for pain management. I think from our perspective, we need to get a better understanding of how it works and how we can better deliver those treatments to the people in need. And when we think about pain, of course, pain is a sensation, it's a burn, it's a sting, it's an ache. We all have back aches, and I sit too long at my desk, so I always thinking about my poor back and how it's just not going to hold out much longer. But so that's the sensation, but pain also modulates our emotions and our cognitions. We get anxious, we get stressed when we're, under, when we're in pain, and we don't think so well. And, at the, and the reverse of this, too, is that uh, cognition and emotion can impact how we perceive pain. And that's really where we're coming from when we think about mind-body therapies. How can we strengthen these emotional and cognitive control to modulate the sensation of pain so maybe you don't need to reach for that opiate medication like you did it before if, you're, if you have other ways of thinking about treating your, your pain symptoms. And just to give you one brief example about why we think this is important and why we think it's working, this is work uh, that, that was done by Catherine Bushnell, who is our science director at the NCAM. This was done when she was still at McGill University. But what she did is she recruited experienced yoga practitioners, and that, that's in the dark circles here. And what she showed is uh, a number of interesting things. Um, increased gray matter in the insula cortex. Now, the insula cortex is very important for encoding information about the emotional and motivational aspects of pain. So these individuals had very large gray matter increases in that area that's important for the modulating the emotional aspects of pain. They also had greater connectivity in that brain region, which is a good thing. And importantly, they were able to tolerate more cold pain here in the dark circles relative to naive controls who had no uh, experience with uh, meditative practice. So this is a very intriguing, interesting finding, of course, that we need to follow up on. But it, it does show you the power of these mind-body approaches in affecting um, brain structure, uh, the neuroplasticity, and also affecting behavior and our tolerance of pain. So very intriguing result. So let's basically um, just give you a very, it was a, just a very short uh, sort of 50 cent tour of what we do at NCAM, and I, I hope that's very interesting to you. I hope too that you'll take advantage and look at our website, ncam.nh.gov. We have a lot of good objective information on how these approaches work and maybe don't work. 
And we also have a very active uh, Twitter. We have many Twitter chats at least once a month on various topics on complementary approaches. So I hope you follow us on Twitter as well. And thank you very much. Let me turn first to Dr. Kiko Glazer and pose a question for you. There are those who believe, and I'm not saying they're scientists, you just hear this all the time, that if it were not for stress, at least short-term stress, I wouldn't have done as well. It helped me focus. It gave me motivation. If I didn't have that stress, if I didn't care, I wouldn't have the stress, and I wouldn't do as well. What do you say to that from a scientific perspective? Short-term stress. Good, is, it, is that a good? Does it exist in terms of the science? Well, you know, it gets into a really odd and interesting area. Um, there are a series of animal studies um, by Ferdos de Bar and Bruce McEwen where they looked at really very short stressors in animals, and they could show a transient enhancement of the immune response. Um, that doesn't replicate well in humans is one of the interesting things. Um, in humans, um, short-term stressors can produce um, a burst of, of lymphocytes. You can see greater cell numbers that are thought to be um, released, but it doesn't appear to be a helpful response. Cognitively, it may be or may not be, but I only speak immunology <laughs> okay. in this case. Fair enough, but you know, there are those who are convinced yeah. uh, by that. Uh, let me uh, pose a question to Dr. Shirtliff. Uh, uh, you were talking, you had a slide on mind-body research and, and, and what you're doing at, at, at NCAM. And, um, it's tough for me, even as a scientist, to get a handle around how you deal with the fact that it's just not, you're just not looking at the effects of meditation or um, massage or uh, yoga because there are different types of techniques for all of those, different skills and instructors. Sure. How do you handle that? How, how is the research community trying to deal with that? Yeah. And how do you communicate to the public that you're making, it, 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 that there are distinctions to be taken into account, that a skillful instructor might well be different in terms of an effect on you as a student of yoga, let's say, than not, a not so skillful instructor? How, how does NCAM deal with that? It's a good question. I think that's sort of the challenge we have, in, as I mentioned, to standardize these protocols. I think the most standardized intervention is the mind-body stress reduction. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn, done at the University of Massachusetts, has really developed a secular approach that's really well thought through and easy to sort of replicate in other laboratories. Um, it, it's sometimes difficult, frankly, when you have different types of yoga, how to really go about studying those, the impact of those different sort of flavors of yoga, and we, we do struggle to, to come up with that. So that's an ongoing challenge for us. I think where we're finding um, it's interesting that we know yoga is, is, is very impactful on the brain is I think just thinking about the work of uh, Richie Davidson, and he's, he's able to, to study and work with the Dalai Lama, for example, and, and people that have tens and thousands of practice sessions with yoga, and it's really clear that practice matters, just like practice matters to be a, a great football player, scientist, et cetera. Practice matters when it comes to yoga, and, and the experienced practitioners, in terms of their connectivity and the neuroplasticity of the brain, is dramatically different the more people practice these skills, and I think that's telling us a lot that it's, it, it, it is something that's real, and it is something that with practice, it, it fundamentally changes the brain. Let me ask you about, about your efforts to get the word out. You mentioned at the very end you have a Twitter account. Yes. As you well know, in this day and age, people are getting information from all sorts of places. Um, how do you compete with that in terms of trying to get the science out when we know that some of the places they're getting their information from are, are more interested perhaps in selling something than they are in actually helping? How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's a very challenging problem. And I, I think what, what we've been able to do, and I think it's, it's, it speaks to our communications department, uh, we have these young 20 and 30-something people that have grown up with social media. I'm a dinosaur. I don't even think I understand Facebook yet. But um, I think what's important is, uh, so we have very good people who understand the technology, number one. Secondly, we don't just do it in isolation. When we do a Twitter chat, we reach out to the Mayo Clinic, to other, uh, 
other institutions that have a very strong knowledge base and, and their own network that they're connected with. So it's not just NCAM trying to do it on its own, but through other, through the FDA, it depends on the topic, other sister agencies within the government, other academic parts, as I said, such as the Mayo Clinic, we're able to reach an even broader audience than we otherwise would have had we just done it ourselves. So we really capitalize on the fact that we're all interconnected and each uh, partner that we work with uh, has their own social network that we then just leverage that and we're able to reach literally millions of people through this technology. I think it's just fascinating. Let me uh, ask uh, people if they have questions to begin to go to the mics, but we have one here, so we'll take that one. Uh, Jessica Windham of AAAS. Uh, my question is for Dr. Keacock Glazer. In some of your slides, you had both stress and depression together, and you were often speaking of them together. And while I understand there can be a genetic basis for depression, I was wondering what role genes may play in our susceptibility or our response to stress. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, there are certainly some suggestions in the literature that that may well be the case. Um, and in a variety of ways for um, a variety of the stress hormones in particular. Um, the other part of it we know, though, is a lot of epigenetic evidence that children who are abused or um, had adverse childhoods um, show differences in terms of, of uh, different brain regions, different you know, structural changes early that have very persistent and important effects. And they show differences then later as well in their endocrine stress responses. They have a much greater rate of depression. Um, and, and they have higher levels of inflammation. In one of the studies I didn't talk about, we actually looked at the addition of adverse childhood and caregiving. And we could actually see the effects of adversity in terms of inflammation in child and, and uh, telomere length, even on top of caregiving. So that it becomes a funny mix that what happens early may make such important epigenetic impacts that it may be hard to sort out in part, but I'm not a genetics person to say more than that, I think. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dave Rabinowitz uh, for Dr. Shirtliff. Uh, when I read about stress and uh, controlling uh, illness symptoms and stuff like that, one of the biggest approaches that I see nowadays is exercise. And I noticed that was totally missing from your presentation. I wonder how that fits into your yeah. institution. It's a great question. And uh, I did show some of the uh, practice meditations, like example, for example, Tai Chi and Qigong, which is actually a combination of movement and meditation. So we go at it from that perspective. Um, certainly across the NIH, um, outside of NCAM, there's a lot of um, research on exercise and its role in stress reduction. And in many of the studies NCAM conducts, we actually have an exercise control. Or if we're doing a yoga um, intervention, we might pair it with normal stretching that you might do uh, with physical therapy or before you go for a run and to compare what are the active ingredients among these different modalities that are important. So we are studying and exercise is critically important. It's just that with limited budgets, sort of our focus and our congressional mandate to study complementary approaches, we've sort of stuck with, with those more traditional um, those approaches. But it's a very good question that certainly exercise can be a, a, an important stress reducer. So I think, yeah, that's a, another area worth studying. And there are NIH institutes at, still looking at that aspect as well. Over here. Hi, my name is Melissa McCoy, and I have a question for Dr. Shirtloff. And that is, you had talked about how you have explored the use of the mind in uh, modulating your perception of pain. Yes. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that technique and, I mean, is it sort of a convincing yourself that it doesn't hurt as much as you think it does? Right. Um, it's actually, that's a very good question about, so it's, it's trying to get into what a yoga practitioner is really experiencing, which is difficult. I, I try to meditate. I, I get so frustrated with it myself because I can't seem to concentrate very well. <laughs> uh, and I don't know how they do it, but I, I keep trying. 
<laughs> but I think what it really is, is again, it, it, from the neurobiological perspective, you're really strengthening areas of the brain that are controlling, modulating the emotional and cognitive aspects of pain. And I think that's what uh, is important. Uh, there's a lot of research on catastrophizing. And what happens is um, people are in pain, but then they start to ruminate and think about it and uh, engage in a lot of emotion and anxiety and stress. And I think what the meditative practice is doing is allowing you to recognize those feelings, those bodily sensations, but to sort of accept, accept them and let them go. And if you really want to dig down into what's going on in the brain, it probably has to do with, as I mentioned, the insular cortex, which is sort of modulating these pain and emotional responses. Also, the anterior cingulate is another area of the brain that may be relevant in modulating pain. And I think meditative practice is somehow influencing these brain structures. And at least what I'm hearing from practitioners is they experience the pain, but they don't experience the emotion of the pain. If that helps. I don't know. That's, yeah. Please, over there, Barbara. Uh, I'm Barbara Gill, the Dana Foundation. It's a question for Dr. Kiko Glazer. Um, I thought I saw when, at, when you, were, you were going very fast at times about caregivers when the person they're caring for uh, passes on, and so that is over. What happens, and is there, is there recovery, or, or, or is the damage done? What happens when that? Um, I had a, I was I was too long on my talk, so I was trying to be brief. So yes, it really is an important point. We looked at caregivers when we look at, at research on uh, what happens with normal bereavement. Uh, a variety of studies suggest that certainly the first few months, the first year, are a really tough time after people lose a spouse. People are depressed. There's clinical depression. It's a very difficult time. People do recover, and then by about two years typically rates of clinical depression and anxiety are, are pretty close to those of people who haven't been bereaved. It's not, people aren't permanently damaged, if I put it in a, in a real gross way, by bereavement. So what we did was we looked at caregivers who had lost their spouse at least three years earlier. So they should have been past the worst of the worst, because we were following people long term even after they stopped caregiving, and we compared them to continuous caregivers. And we asked the question, is the slope different in terms of IL-6? And the really distressing point was that there's no difference. Mm -hmm. No difference at all between people who had been bereaved and those who were still continuously caregiving. We had two explanations for it that I think are both valid and not mutually exclusive. One may be that people are actually aging the immune response. That there may be a point in time through a variety of brain mechanisms, through immunological changes, that, that you may actually age the slope, and not, it may be a point of no return in some ways, that there's accelerated aging. But the second has to do with the caregiver's experience. You know that caregiver slide I put up at first, where the, I was talking about the woman who rarely went out except for necessary errands, mm -hmm. and rarely invited people to her home because of embarrassment about her husband's behavior. Caregivers lose big chunks of their social networks. We see that in our data, I see it in other people's data. And that's really important because close personal relationships are one of the best anti-stress mechanisms we have. So when people stop caregiving, we look at our caregivers, they're lonelier, they have fewer people in their network, as other people show. And they continue to have persistent higher, higher levels of depressive symptoms. So they may be aging, but they also may be suffering from what happens when you're older. If you're 75, you don't go out and say, oh, I'm going to have a whole new group of new friends like you do when you're 20. Mm -hmm. You lose big parts of your network, and it makes a big difference. Yes, please. I think this is a question for Dr. Shirtleff. I'm a physical therapist and Alexander Technique teacher, and I'm, yes. I'm on the front lines every yes. day dealing mm -hmm. with people with chronic pain. Yes. And while things have significantly improved as far as using non-pharmacological interventions, yeah. I am still seeing a lot of people being over-medicated right. by their physicians. Yes. And so I'm curious about what's being done very specifically and deliberately to be educating physicians to help communicate to their patients. I mean, I think the public is very well aware and the public is constantly seeking 
I don't have a single person that comes into my office and says, give me medicine. Everybody says, I don't want to do this with drugs. But there seems to be a little bit of a lag clinically. No, you're absolutely right. That's an excellent observation, and you're, you're right on. I think that's where we have to sort of think about sort of a holistic approach and how do we really change medical practice, which, as you know, being in the front line is not so easy. So we try to do it in a number of ways. We have uh, specific parts of our website are devoted to clinical practitioners, and we address some of these issues head on. I think it really is a cultural change. I'm heartened to see that the VA and the DOD get it. I mean, they're, they are really dealing with it's something like 30% um, of the uh, service members coming back from these wars have PTSD and comorbid for pain. And many of the service members themselves are realizing that these frontline treatments are not working. And so it's really getting, keeping, uh, first of all, establishing an evidence base, which is, I think, what we do very well at NCAM in, in providing the research to suggest that these approaches can be efficacious and effective. And then the harder part, though, is really changing culture. And we do it every which way. Uh, you know, Twitter is one way, the, our web, going to major medical conferences to get the word out, having uh, constituent groups talk about these other approaches. And really, it's, it's a case that one size doesn't fit all. It may be the case that for some individuals, and it may be genetics, that opiates work really well. And for others, it's probably the worst thing you could possibly do to someone. So it's finding that balance. It's how we educate the medical community. It's really something we are struggle with at the NIH a lot. And we're trying to do better, but I think it's just a very hard area and very challenging area when you're trying to change a culture. But I, I agree with you. I think we need to be, do a better job there of educating the medical profession about options. And once those options are available, the other thing is how do we connect a physician to a physical therapist, to a yoga practitioner? It's not just enough to know that these things, these interventions, these modalities can be useful. How do you get the physician to connect to these other modalities that are a little bit outside the, the, the mainstream? So we have to do a better job, too, of connecting the dots for physicians as well. Yes, please. Hi. Um, can I be heard? I'm short. I tend to adjust um, microphone. Sometimes too much. Sometimes not enough. I can. Um, but anyway, my question is. Um, Could you identify um, yourself? Pardon me. Identify yourself. Oh yes. My name is. I will use the name. My name is Polly Math. I tend to use that when as my pseudonym, I shall say. But I'll identify exactly. I do work at U.S. Department of Education. I work on the STEM programs. Mm -hmm which is the acronym I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But the question is, in a way, more for personal lives than for something that I'm writing something on um, contextually at the office. And that's the physio physiological, and certainly, by the way, you can underscore what the physical therapist is saying. I myself am undergoing physical therapy due to not being too careful at a metro station. I mean, some of these iPhones are as big as my fingernail and people can be texting on them and apparently um, you don't e you yield to them they don't yield to pedestrians <laughs> that are and that was made very clear to me by the um, look that I got in my face by somebody who was about six feet tall and very big and very pregnant and very texting ran into me and the, and the look I got in her face without helping me up as I landed on the platform. And so the PT has been helpful much more than um, drugs, shall we, psychoactive drugs. Anyways, what are these physical painful reactions to stress? And I even had them as a child. I called them the Labor Day lumps back then. That was always the worst weekend for me when it was back to school. Even though I was a sufficient student, it was the big transition that I made from having to take out different types of clothing, having to have homework every day, et cetera. And that was horrible. I still get that same thing. I had one very recently. I have a family member who shall be nameless, but unfortunately, he's my only sibling. And even though he's a medical doctor, and his wife happens to be a yoga instructor, you would think that they'd be the wonder, a wonderful pair, and they you know, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the question. Well, the question that I've gotten to is, what is the physical reactions to stress that I get? I got one recently from 
something that they did to me. I have an elderly mother. I don't have any other parents. I don't have any other, I don't really have any significant others. So it's as though I, you know, I turn to my work. I turn to a lot of events that I go to. I turn to my physical therapy for, for outlets. But still, I still get, and I'm sure other people do, get these lumps that just, this depression won't go away. It's physical as though somebody punched you in the stomach or you can't sleep, you can't concentrate, and you don't, and it's hard to do, it's harder to do as well. It's not contrived. Now, can any of you on the panel, um, or you, sir, dismiss what I am saying? Well, let me turn to the experts and ask them to respond to that. Yeah, Thanks for the question. Yeah, the, the physiological. I, I can try a couple of ways. What people are talking more and more about is depression as an inflammatory disease. Um, one thing I alluded to in terms of when I was talking, there are some, some really nice studies where they looked at alpha interferon when it's, it's been used as a cancer treatment. And when people are injected with alpha interferon, you produce serious clinical depression in at least half of the people. They found that if that they had many people stop the treatment because they became suicidal and they had suicides. And they found that by pretreating with antidepressants, it made a difference in people's ability to tolerate the treatment. Mm -hmm. So that uh, inflammation in and of itself, when you have a, a burst of inflammation uh, over a prolonged period, it can indeed induce depression. So part of the idea and part of the link between stressful events in one's life and then depression may be, in fact, that inflammatory link that goes on and then become and, and, and feeds into that cycle, and then you have that really, really nasty feedback loop. In terms of pain, it also becomes an issue because higher inflammation is related to greater pain sensitivity. So when you're stressed or depressed, pain is worse. In our caregivers, one of the things we found that we didn't actually include in the article, when we gave the initial punch biopsy, everybody got exactly the same punch biopsy. We had uh, lidocaine at the site, so it, wasn't, it shouldn't have been that bad, et cetera, et cetera. But in the first few days after, caregivers rated the pain as significantly worse. When people are stressed or depressed, pain perception is enhanced hmm. for a variety of reasons. And so there, can't, there are things we simply don't understand, but that stress and depression as a kind of really nasty mix do unfortunately make feedback to in ways you're describing. Right. That's, yeah. Well, I would really recommend trying to do some stress reduction. Yeah. Stress reduction strategies I think are really helpful and really important. I think you heard David talking about the importance of practice, and I'd really second that. We had a couple of yoga studies. One was just comparing experience versus Nava yoga practitioners. There were huge differences in inflammation. It was a cross-sectional study, so we had to go on and do the randomized control trial, but it, they, there were really big differences between the two groups. Then in the randomized control trial, we had 200 breast cancer survivors, and it was a weightless control design and really nicely designed. And we found that women who practiced more had much greater reductions in inflammation. So I'd say I think the mind-body practices really have a good possibility of working for many people. The, uh, we have two, two people standing with questions. We'll make these the last two. And then we'll get, yes, you first, please. Hello. My name is Lorna Grenadier, and I've thoroughly enjoyed, I'm not a scientist <laughs> or anything technical, but have thoroughly enjoyed all of these series and have learned so very much. So thank the... Uh, Dana Foundation and AAAS. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the earlier question about the efficacy of the alternative approaches to pain mm -hmm. and wondering at what point the medical community and more specifically the insurance industry <laughs> might be willing to compensate uh, people who explore those avenues for relief. David, that's definitely for yeah, you, right? <laughs> Uh, no, it's an excellent question, and you know, this is where I think, I, this may sound a bit defensive, but it's unfortunately true for us at the NIH. We are probably the preeminent research institution, I would ha hazard to say, in the world, and when it comes to understanding and studying, uh, you know, whatever disease you can think of. I think where we have to sort of look to others within the government is to how do we get that, you know, CMS, for example, that's involved in uh, Medicaid and Medicare, and how that is determined in terms of who gets 
uh, compensated or what's, what's uh, a billable uh, treatment is something that really falls in that domain. But what we can do, and I think what we continue to do, and, and we do pretty well, I think, is provide that evidence base, that research base, so that policymakers and others can say, here's a body of evidence, here's a body of research that suggests this particular modality, this particular intervention, intervention is efficacious in an obje under objective research conditions. Can, get, based on the strength of that evidence, now can we bring it into primary care, have it uh, taken up by insurance companies, CMS and others, so that patients can actually benefit from these interventions. So I, I, we sort of stop short of that at the NIH. We do the research and we hope that the policymakers will take the next, take the baton and move it to the next level to actually benefit the health of the nation. Um, we provide that research that we hope they'll use to, to, to improve practice. And I, I think also NIH does reach out to patient disease groups in trying yes. to get get them, if you will, right. yes, to be to, at the forefront of making the this, this, uh, the, yes. the policy issues yes. known to those who have the ability to make a change. Yes, they, that's where the patient advocacy groups come in for sure. And we do reach out to them and we do provide the information to advocacy groups. We provide the information to policymakers, Congress and the White House. So we try to do our best to inform people that can change medical practice that through the ACA, I think that's getting easier, uh, potentially, through other mechanisms that have been put in place. So we're hopeful, and we, we hope that we provide that information that will, in fact, change medical practice. Thank you. And yes, ma'am, please. Uh, Peggy Siegel, education free agent and Ohio State graduate three times. <laughs> uh, my question was, uh, was about caregivers. And I'm wondering if you've looked at the impact of the relationship of the caregiver to the, the person giving, being given care in terms of spouse, um, sibling, uh, ch child, or non-related, and if that has any impact. And then secondly, in terms of uh, social isolation, have there been any proactivity where groups of caregivers can be provided with yoga or meditation or ways to uh, use that as a strategy to give them social engagement that breaks out of their social, social isolation? Thank you. In terms of caregiving and, and the role of caregivers, it gets to be kind of a muddy area. We tried to look at it a little bit, and it gets really complicated. Um, offspring caregivers that we called care kids, uh, care, caring for a parent, uh, report greater stress than spousal caregivers. And they're, part of it is the issue of the sandwich generation. They're often caring for their own children while they're also caring for a parent. So they're in between and they have a job. With many of our older caregivers, that wasn't true. Um, Younger caregivers don't show this as ma great a magnitude of immune change, but they're younger. And so again, it's the idea that if you're younger, you may not show the same degree and it may not be as deleterious, at least in the short run. So it's a really hard question to unravel. Um, the flip side of that is for the older caregivers, it's, it's really a double whammy in terms of the spouses because your spouse is supposed to be, in most cases, your major source of support, your partner. If your major source of support is instead your major stress and you don't have an alternative, you really are stranded. So in terms of what's been done, they've, they've tried a lot of different things. I don't know. Um, I think they actually have done some uh, alternative things, but I don't know that literature well. They've, there, are, there are caregiving support groups. Um, those are often a little muddied and hard to study because part of the issue is who chooses to go to them. Um, and they've tried respite care. And there's um, Steve Zaret at the university uh, at Penn State as part of the, the expert on, on much of that. And he's shown some nice results from some better respite studies. Some of the earlier ones, they had real trouble getting people to take respite because the caregivers would think, well, I've got to clean the house and I've got to do all this stuff and spend more time with my spouse before I can get the respite care. So it became even a more of a stressor. But, the, but it does appear to be promising. But certainly social interventions are, I think, really important.
Well, you know, after hearing all of that, I'm very feel very good about the fact that we are at least for two hours in a stress-free zone here at Triple <laughs> uh, Before I ask you to join me in thanking our speakers, we will uh, adjourn and go out into the uh, foyer for some refreshments. Please join us, but please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>